How would you propose creating additional quality seats in DPS? Are innovation schools and zones and charter schools part of a viable strategy or do you favor other approaches? If so, what are they? Great question and thank you so much for this opportunity to answer this question. I think before we could even get to the question of what are we doing with the seats? Where are these seats? We have to get smart and look at the budget. We have to dig in and become fiscally responsible in looking at where our dollars are being spent. Where are the small school zones taking place? Putting in plans of actions for any schools that have less than 400 students. So it's a multifaceted plan. One, we have to do a SWOT analysis and become nerds dive deep into the budget and say, where are we spending the money? Where can we allocate other money? Second, looking at those schools that are hitting 400 and putting um, in an action plan that once it hits 350, this plan then goes into action. In order to make that happen, we ask the community to be a part of that. What does this look like in terms of nonprofits, businesses, and organizations that can help support this plan? Lastly, third of this entire plan is that we have to think 10, 20 years from now, <clears throat> not just today, but generationally. What are these two first things going to do to help us impact this long-term change and plan? Then we can get to what are the innovation zones and the charter schools and the community charter schools and where are the spaces and places in which we need them? Where are the seats and places in which we're losing them? We have to know the picture before we can say, let's do this. That picture will inform my decision making in which those happens. I think there's a place for all of those components um, and variables, but we just can't keep throwing money on opportunities without knowing the true picture of Denver Public Schools. And currently, I'm the only candidate that is seeking those answers and that kind of resolution. DPS tiene un gran desafío para ayudar a los niños a aprender a leer al nivel de su grado. ¿Cómo podría el distrito usar la orden judicial que exige los servicios para los estudiantes del idioma inglés para aprovechar una mejor instrucción de alfabetización para todos los estudiantes que necesitan ayuda adicional? I think the fact that this question is even being asked shows that there is a problem, right? There is a court order. DPS should be following through. They should be building partnerships. This should be um, uh, uh, an issue for them that, that has risen to the top. And so why hasn't it? Partly because there's not been effective leadership and Latino leadership, especially for Latino males and families on the school board. Individuals that can speak to the experience of those students. And so if you don't have a voice at the table speaking to those experiences, oftentimes, even though it is a concern and it is a, a high level issue, it can be missed. And so I promise to our community that this will be a concern and, 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 and an issue that I raise immediately as somebody that comes in and says, we need to start working with the, the courts, follow the court mandated, but I'm going to take it a step further. It is time for us to look at all of our state policies and laws and mandates that are within DPS and see what are archaic and what is not working against us and for us. And it is time for us to dismantle that component in peace. That is one of my major priorities is to go in and see what state laws and policies are strangleholding our families and not allowing us to give them the most equitable education possible. How would you measure how far behind students may have fallen as a result of COVID? And how successful is the district in catching them up? immediately coming together with our superintendent and creating a universal assessment, a day one catch one phrase assessment of that day. Not one that is punitive or deficit model thinking, but one in which will give us a clear picture of where we are at today. And then the ongoing evaluation of that. But then at that same time, we have to come up with a plan, a plan of action, not just to address literacy, but to also address math and science and other skills. We know in particular for black and Latino students, their grades and, and their literacy scores have not risen from 10 to 12 percent in the last 12 years, that means that we need to then look at what are we doing ineffectively. And so that says doing a universal assessment, creating a plan of action, working with nonprofits, working with our school systems, uh, within our school departments to be able to then create what are the, the metrics in which we're going to follow the, 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 the uh, success of our students. But then lastly, working with our families at home finding what are the things they need. As a mental health professional, none of this matters if the epigenetic trauma that it, our students endured is not first taken care of. We need to be coming, we need to have a focus on mental wellness first and foremost. Mental wellness and a strong foundation, Maslow before Bloom, will be able to get us to what we need for our students. So I propose, as we now are launching the new Early Childhood and Preschool Division, EC has the Tri-Chair uh, Summit Chair, um, that DPS needs to be ready to understand 
understand what it's going to be like with these students coming into the system, not ready to learn with the emotional trauma and the epigenetic trauma. The same supports we want to give them, we should give to our students. We're not succeeding there. And so if we want to increase literacy scores, we have to increase mental wellness supports and community-based projects and, and, and partnerships. What would be your approach to ensuring teachers and schools are accountable for students' performance? It's a great question. Um, I'm a nerd. So I would be the nerd representing District 4. And so immediately it's about coalescing and creating. I've talked about metrics and data. We have to be able to create partnerships and leverage. So as I've talked about, I'm running this campaign with our students and families in mind, the district in mind, and our community partnerships and members in mind. And so bringing all of those individuals together, but giving the parents the voice. Our parents know what they need for our children, but we're not seeing that as an asset. We need to reframe the parent voice as an asset within Denver Public Schools. We need to reframe the student voice and experience as the number one uh, important variable for us to succeed in. Then, at that end, we will then be able to do all of the other great things. And so it's about the community voice at the table. Um, look at what has happened when we've developed community charter schools. The community has come together and have done some amazing things with great ideas. Why are we not listening to community members? That's why I'm running. I've been sitting back, doing my work, leading and fighting, and no one is stepping up. And it's time that we have integrity and accountability, especially on these issues. What does equity mean to you? And how would you ensure that all DPS students are receiving an equitable education? Equity is simple. It's about addressing disparities. That is what we should be looking at. What are the disparities that are impacting our students? Not what are the deficits that they bring to the classroom, low socioeconomic, mental, those are not the things we should be looking at at our students. It should be the opposite. What are the disparities in which that are not allowing them to become successful with all of those things that they bring in with them? And so that looks at one, looking at our budget. How much money are we spending on outside uh, contracts and what is, the, what is the ROI on these contracts? I know that there's, we spent millions of dollars for individuals to send newsletters out, and they get $75,000 a year to send a newsletter out once a month. Right? If we are able to look at smartly what are we doing with this money, then be able to transform that into other places. And so truly that, I think, is how my approach to this piece. Is, is how, that's what we need to be looking at is the entire system and the dismantling of that. How will you take the time to involve yourself in the community and really put the community and the students above yourself? This is an amazing question. Um, first and foremost, this is the most selfless job I think that anybody can do. Be a Denver Public School Board member. Like, who in their right mind would want to take on a position in which they are um, never thanked, always attacked, and, and all their decisions are always second guessed? That's why I'm running because I have a tenure and a history of working on my community for 28 years and putting my community first. I've crossed the battle lines when I needed to, how to count when I needed to, um, made sure that the community voice in every decision and the work that I did was first and foremost. As a community leader, I'm always surrounded by the community voice. As a nonprofit leader and CEO of a mental health organization, my members inform the work that we do and the professional development. So parents are the reason why I'm running. Because parents do not have an active voice, a voice that actually understands the nuances of the work of a school board member. So first and foremost, I'll introduce what truly a school board member is supposed to do. The nerdy work, right? So that families understand that they have a place in understanding the fiscal management and responsibility and policies. But more importantly, that they can have a voice in leading. And so I'll coalesce, I'll reach out to all of the community agencies, important parent agencies, and groups that are in my neighborhood, many I already work with. Um, but I will organize and meet with them um, monthly. I currently have a radio show and so I will uh, evolve that to a podcast where I'm bringing on families and we're having these uh, intellectual conversations but also I will be on the ground because that's what they want somebody that is a foot soldier I'm a foot soldier for the greater good I don't need this job I've been asked to do this because we need somebody first and foremost that understands it and won't politicize your children and that's how I'll build a relationship with our community